In the Jedi Order's long history, they have shaped the galaxy in many influential ways. One may say that without the Jedi, the Republic itself may not have withstood so many thousands of years. So each new era brings on a new kind of challenge, whether it being a rising Sith or a faction war. The Jedi hardly ever fail to rise to the occasion and take up arms for the peace of the galaxy. In each of these great periods of time, the Jedi would always have great leaders to gather the forces of light and lead them to victory. The position of a Jedi Grand Master is the highest rank achievable within the Order, and is one that few Jedi have ever held. Today though, we are going to be listing out and talking about all the Jedi Grand Masters that we know of in both Legends and Canon. So be sure to grab a snack, as this holocron will be going back several millennia to learn about the great Grand Masters of old. In our video about the very first Grand Master, we mentioned that the position was a little difficult to triangulate, as the first Jedi didn't have a Grand Master but rather a council of masters that equally saw to the comings and goings of the Order. In the modern fashion of the Order, the Jedi High Council does have many masters on it, but it's the Grand Master that makes the final decisions. Back in the day of Tython though, this wasn't really a thing, as all the masters on the High Council held equal power. Eventually though, the Jedi Order would move to the world of Osis after Tython became too inhospitable. Originally we had thought that the Jedi Grand Master was Biel Duktaves, who was the very first. However, my scholars and acolytes, we were wrong about this, and our researchers have found a hidden chamber in the ruins of Osis, one that tell the tale of a Grand Master that predates Duktaves by almost 12,000 years. Having died somewhere around the year 24,500 BBY, the very first Grand Master of the Jedi Order, according to our research, was a human male by the name of Aldrista Pina. This particular Grand Master was known for his love of battle and led the Jedi Order against the legions of Leto during the War of the First Great Schism. This being before the era of lightsabers, Master Pina instead used two force-imbued katana-like blades, swords embedded with emerald kyber crystals. Master Pina was a man who had an insatiable lust for combat, something that we don't typically see in Jedi Grand Masters. It was written that the Grand Master defeated the legions of Leto and a man named Zendor in single combat combat extremely easily. Zendor was one of the first Dark Jedi in all of galactic history, and he was bested by the Grand Master. But the Grand Master was not done there, as he tracked down Zendor's lover, a Dark Jedi by the name of Arden Lin, and engaged her with single combat as well. The fight was fierce, and resulted in one of his blades being shattered against the power of a talisman that Lin was wearing. The shards of the Grand Master's blade ended up mortally wounding him, However, he refused to die until he made sure that all of those who were involved and all those that embraced the dark side were no more. Using the force technique known as Morchiro, Pina caused all of Lin's body functions to cease, causing her heart to stop entirely. This ultimately resulted in the death of the Grand Master though, although he made good on his promise and did stop the darkness from flourishing. Master Pina earns a place as Grand Master as he was a powerhouse in live combat, and could clearly call upon highly advanced force techniques even when weakened. He was renowned for his skill, and it is appropriate that the first Jedi Grand Master was a pure-hearted warrior full of strength. Much time in the history and lore would pass though before we get the next Grand Master that we are aware of, of course, Biel Duktaves. Biel Duktaves lived during what is known as the Pius Deo Crusades. These crusades were a series of conflicts that lasted a thousand years, and they were started by a human-centric religious sect that had violent militaristic tendencies. The group was successful in getting one of their own by the name of Constapex I, appointed as the Supreme Chancellor. The Chancellor then launched the campaign. Having neutralized the Huts, the sect unleashed a series of military crusades and inquisitions against rival alien species over the following hundreds of years. Every term, the Supreme Chancellor would be replaced with another of the Pius Dea, and would take the same name, and would continue their series of wars, harshly splitting the humans of the core worlds and the alien species of the Outer Rim apart. This continued all the way into Chancellor Constapex the 19th. This was finally put to an end when the Jedi got involved and conspired alongside a group of peacekeepers to cause a rift with the Pius Dea which soon eventually toppled their rule, arresting the Chancellor after one final battle. After the Chancellor was tried and imprisoned on the planet of Kamas, the Jedi High Council installed Diktaves in the office of the Supreme Chancellor, holding both the Grand Master and the Supreme Chancellor titles, and served as the Grand Master of the Jedi Order still during his tenure. 
leading both the Republic and the Jedi. Interestingly enough, we later found out that Duktaves wasn't the only Jedi Grand Master that also served in the office of the Supreme Chancellor, but we'll come to that later on in the video. The next Jedi Grand Master is one who truly deserved the title, as she led a truly legendary life. This was the Jedi Grand Master, Nomi Sunrider. Nomi Sunrider served the Jedi Order during the time of the Freed and Nad Uprising and the Great Sith War, as started, of course, by Exar Kun. Nomi fought in both of these wars, and about 10 years after the death of Exar, she would rise through the ranks and become the Grand Master. Nomi was responsible for rebuilding the Order after the damage was done by Exar Kun, especially after he destroyed the Great Library on Osis. Despite all of her glorious accomplishments though, as her legend is still taught to Jedi Padawans today, Nomi Sunrider stood out just because of how massively powerful she was. Sunrider's sensitivity to the Force allowed her to become one of the most powerful and accomplished Jedi that had ever lived mastering battle meditation, even to the point of using the light side to compel her enemies to kill one another. This to me is an absolute insane feat of power, as light side battle meditation usually only causes confusion and fear in the ranks of the enemies, while simultaneously bolstering the coordination and courage of one's allies. However, Nomi's battle meditation was so powerful that she could confuse the enemy so badly that they mistook their own ranks for the enemy and would fire upon one another. Nomi could also shatter Sith spells of commanding animals, and this caused the beast to become wildly confused and easy to slay. What's more, is Nomi could also use a force power known as Battle Mind, doing this to utterly destroy illusions cast by Sith magicians. Moreover, Grandmaster Sunrider could use force deflection and two to menace to absorb or reflect force powers and blaster bolts, and even turn them back on the attackers, a feat that can only equate to have been done by an individual of the power of someone like Mace Windu. Nomi Sunrider was an absolute master of the force light ability also, to the point where she was able to conjure bursts of entire walls of light energy. This she used to capture the spirit of Exar Kun, and this is a power we have only seen by one other individual in Grand Master Luke Skywalker. However, what is most impressive about Nomi Sunrider is the fact that she was able to manipulate the midichlorians and influence them thousands of years before Darth Plagueis. Nomi demonstrated this power by causing the midichlorians to die within the Dark Jedi, effectively cutting him off from the Force and stripping him of his powers entirely. One of the only other beings to have used this kind of power was Darth Sion and Nihilus, who only achieved this when they combined their powers in the dark side, cutting their master Darth Treya off from the Force. But Nomi did this by herself and with far less time. Grandmaster Sunrider might be among the most powerful Jedi Grandmasters to have ever lived in all of the lore, and is one of the few Grandmasters that we can hold up to the likes of Yoda and even Luke Skywalker. The next Grandmaster on our list would unfortunately be another unremarkable master by the name of Zim. Grandmaster Zim was a Keldor male that served during the time of the Great Galactic War. This is a period of time when the Sith Empire eventually would return, and it was under Grandmaster Zim that the Jedi attempted to broker a peace with the Sith. However, his short-sightedness caused the Empire to lure him away from Coruscant, there where they would promptly invade and even destroy the Jedi Temple. Grandmaster Zim refused to send help to Satil Shan and her master, Darla Nala, when they were attacked by Sith warships, fearful of breaking the treaty with the Sith, even though the Sith broke it right there. Zim was unremarkable and was extremely disappointing as a Grandmaster, but was even more disappointing than his time as Grandmaster was his death. Zim was killed by an escaped bounty hunter. Zim would be succeeded by one Satil Shan though, two years after his assassination and Satil Shan was far from a disappointment. Grandmaster Satil is legendary to the story of the Old Republic, as she was the one who bravely held out against the Sith during the Cold War, and it would be Satil who fought alongside Revan to defeat his darker half and destroy Vitiate once and for all. Satil Shan was renowned as a warrior, being one of the greatest duelists that the Jedi had ever seen, renowned for her skill as a fighter and never holding back. As a young warrior, she was even responsible for wounding Darth Malgus to the point of requiring cybernetics and a respirator. As a descendant of Revan and the Jedi Bastila, Satil was incredibly naturally gifted in the Force, and she was skilled with the use of telekinesis, 
as she could topple mountains even as a Jedi Knight. Even as a Knight, not a Master, mind you, she went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Darth Malgus, and even managed to block one of his lightsaber blades with her bare hands using two to menace. Satil's powers would only grow over her long life, and by the Battle of Ren Var, she was able to destroy a blast door simply by using the Force to break it into pieces. When the Jedi Order was faced with droids that threatened to destroy Jedi Knights, Satil managed to stop all of them with a mere gesture of her hands. Her skills with the lightsaber were so incredible that she had been trained by Kao Senderic, the Jedi Order's Battlemaster, and she was able to hold her own against Darth Vindican and Malgus as a Padawan. And even though Malgus was the superior duelist, he was soon overwhelmed by Satil's raw power in the Force, and many have hypothesized that strength to strength in the Force alone, Satil was more powerful than Malgus. Moving on in the timeline, we have someone by the name of Grandmaster Ganara. Ganara, who served during the time of the New Sith Wars in the year 1035 BBY. While unfortunately a lot of the information we have on Grandmaster Ganara is very scarce, we do know that she was one of the only other Jedi Grandmasters to serve as Supreme Chancellor of the Old Republic, the same as Jedi Biel Duktaves did putting her in a very difficult position, especially during this era, as she had to take care of the Sith from under the table. Due to the fact that as Chancellor, she couldn't publicly endorse attacks on the Sith Empire. Likely for the best, she would be the last Jedi to serve as a politician, and it was clear that as a Jedi, they were not able to fulfill their sworn duty while also trying to be more involved with the Senate directly and politics. Although we know very little on Grandmaster Ganara, it is likely that this insight saved a great many Jedi as well as political lives. Next in the timeline, we have a Grandmaster that many will be familiar with, and that is Grandmaster Faye Coven. Being an exceptionally influential Grandmaster, we did a holocron all about her, and many will recognize her as the author of the Jedi Path. Grandmaster Faye was the Grandmaster of the Jedi during the time between the Old Republic and the High Republic, and she mostly spent her days ensuring the proper rebuilding of the Jedi after the War of the Brotherhood of Darkness. In that time, Padawans were being shipped off to the front lines of war almost as soon as they were competent with their lightsabers. When the war was completed, it became apparent that there was some confusion left on how Padawans should be properly trained, since the Sith were seemingly now gone forever. Because of this, Grandmaster Faye would author a Jedi path in order to repair the training that the war had done on the Jedi Padawans. Grandmaster Fay Coven was an incredibly peaceful individual who believed exclusively in diplomacy, so much so to the point where she refused to carry a lightsaber. She would be succeeded by a couple of Grandmasters following this point though, which is rare, that we assume that Grandmaster Fay appointed directly. As we enter the High Republic, this would be the first period of time where there are actually multiple Grand Masters at one time, with the Grand Masters appointed being Pra Tre Vedder, Rai Ki Saka, Laru, and Grand Master Yoda. We are grouping all of these four together because they served as co-Grand Masters during the High Republic. Indeed, during this time, there was not one, but four who shared the title of Grand Master simultaneously. Unfortunately, and quite frustratingly so, we have very little information on these Grand Masters, of course, besides Yoda. All we really know is that Prey Ter Vedder was a Tarnab male who aided during the hyperspace crisis. Rai Kisaka was a human, and Laru was an Anx. Grandmaster Laru was extremely peaceful and insisted that the Jedi remain distant from the galactic conflicts involving political wars and the Republic, keeping them far away from the Senate. Yoda would remain as the Jedi Grandmaster mostly by the Order of Elimination following this point though, as he was the last living member of this small co-op group of Grandmasters that would follow into the Republic Classic era. And that brings us neatly to Yoda, and of course following this, his protege, Luke Skywalker, who need no further explanation. Well my friends, this was a longer video, so if you did make it until the end, we congratulate and thank you very much for watching. There are technically two other Grandmasters who temporarily replaced Luke Skywalker, those being Kenth Hamner, who was appointed by the New Republic to control the Jedi, and Saba Sabatine, a Jedi loyal to Luke who took back the title of Grandmaster from Hamner and held it until Luke returned and claimed it yet again. Though their terms were brief though, and Luke did end up taking his rightful place as Grandmaster after this, we didn't think it was entirely necessary to give them a whole section. 
and we thought just mentioning them would be enough. Anyway, my friends and acolytes, if you like this video, be sure to let us know if you want a whole holocron dedicated to any of these masters. And of all of the Grand Masters, besides Luke and Yoda, as that would be cheating, which is your favorite? As always, my friends, thank you so much for watching this longer video today. If you've enjoyed, please leave a like, and may the Force be with you always.